Today's main topic is the top five luxury cars of all time. What's up, folks? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. We love Off the Record. You know why? They're here to help you. If you get pulled over, if you get a ticket, you don't plead guilty. That's for the suckers. And you're not a sucker, are you? Instead, get a hold of Off the Record. Go to offtherecord.com slash TST or download that Off the Record app and use code TSTPOD, T-S-T-P-O-D. What Off the Record will do is they'll set you up with a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction that you got pulled over in, and uh, and they'll fight that ticket for you. That might mean paperwork. That might mean meeting with prosecutors. That might mean going to court. The whole shebangabang. They'll do all of it, and then they'll call you. And very much, most likely, they'll say, your ticket has been dismissed, your ticket has been reduced. They've got a fantastic success rate, so much so that they have a money-back guarantee. If Off the Record can't get those points off of your record, you don't pay. So go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TSTPOD on the Off the Record app and get 10% off all legal services for off the record. They are great. I get emails every single week from folks who say, man, they really saved me on this one. Really hooked it up. They're loving it. I've used them myself and uh, and, and they'll help you too. So make sure you call off the record before pleading guilty. They will get you out of a jam. All right, folks, on this show, we are talking about things of luxury. Top five luxury cars of all time. Zach and I have our list. Plus, the reason we're doing this list is because I'm reviewing the Rolls-Royce Spectre, Rolls-Royce's first EV, a $580,000 uh, ginormous two-door vehicle. It's all about luxury cars on this episode of the Smoking Tire Podcast. But, like, all of these businesses are, like, seven days a week yeah they either like lot, exist yeah. in the air in time and space or they're literally open every single day with like customers who want things every single day like even the shop like we're gonna close for easter like we are closing for easter but like i sent out a, an email that was like you know we're gonna be closed and we're closed for like seven holidays a year and the customer, I got a couple emails back, like, wait, you're going to be closed? Like, I, I plan to get this thing. And it's like, well, okay, you know, got to give good customer service. So now, like, the staff has already been given off. So, like, I have to be here. Now I'm here on the holiday. Can't they grab their car the day before? Or it's not, they're mm, paying a lot of money to yeah. be here. You got it. You got you. We're, it's in this economy right now where spending $800 a month is a, is a lot of money, your car is no longer an appreciating, appreciating asset. For two years, your car was an appreciating asset. So spending the money didn't matter because mm -hmm. your car was going up. Right. Now, cars don't go up anymore. Cars are, cars are spends. But I would bet that a lot of your customers have enough assets where the, those are also going up. My friend, this is Los Angeles. Yeah. You cannot judge someone's net worth or well, net income by, by their car. car. Yeah, that's a good point. No, you cannot. <laughs> These are wildly divorced concepts. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So, so no. A lot of people with very nice cars are looking for ways to spend less money mm. and not giving the very best over-the-top customer service is a surefire way for some of these folks to decide that – what am I paying all that money for anyway? Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's fair. Uh, yeah. Well, luckily so you are. So, fortunately, I have a, a very calm and balanced uh, life. It's well, luckily news. you're a Yudin. So what? <laughs> you're Jewish. So oh, Easter yeah. doesn't matter. It much, doesn't matter to but me. But it's still annoying. No. Yeah. I won't be in church. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, that's that's what it is, right? That's what it is. If you want to buy all these fun toys, this is what the other side of that looks like. 100%. Yeah. If you want to buy all these fun toys and actually be able to afford them and not live your life upside down in fucking credit, this is what the other side of that looks like. Yeah. You gotta, you're yeah. running, when, especially if you're building a business, which you yeah. are, you know, until it, and anybody, regardless of industry, you could be, you could make heating and air conditioning shit. You could, you could own an HVAC install place that does really well. And so you're saying you, know, you could make 
heating and air conditioning shit or install heating and air conditioning I, I, shit. I had those, those like too. locked in my head as like it's always the HVAC. It could be anything, but yeah. you know you got to work really it's, hard for a, a super well, period HVAC of time. is always it's like that's always presented as like the least glamorous possible job. Plumbing maybe. I assure you that the money I pay to both plumbers and HVAC people. Those guys are probably on a yacht right now. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But they probably work. They got to work yeah. really hard to afford the yacht. Yeah. You know, the toys always require work. Yeah, yeah. So here we are. Anyway, in the in the in a very reduced state of anxiety. First crew show in a minute. Uh, we've released our our merchandising line. I'm wearing one of the new sweatshirts designed by Zach. You can yeah. head over to the smoking either you can either go to the smoking tire shop.com or you can go to the smoking tire.com and click on merch yep either way we'll take you to the same place we got t-shirts we got sweatshirts we got hats we got the first line of stuff very limited production we only made a few of each one uh we absolutely welcome your uh, feedback uh, what you want to see next what kind of what kind of swag you might want to buy we've been out of the out of the merch game for a minute but it is going now maybe if we sell a lot of them I can quit one of my four jobs um, you just added a fifth job which is fashion shit, design I, we and, did, and merchandising we? yeah God damn it yeah and we're trying to do this live podcasting thing like like touring podcasting like that's a whole job fucking too. Yeah. But that's also why that hasn't gotten off the ground yet. It's because it's a fifth or sixth Absolutely thing. Absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely true. There are too many goddamn things. Um, but been driving a bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, some of it we can't talk about because it's for the magazine or it's embargoed like Tycon GT. What This show goes out what? Thursday? This sh- Tuesday, Tuesday. Which is the April 2nd. 3rd. 2nd? Either way, it's not Tycon Embargo, which is the 10th. So I can't tell you about Tycon GT. I went back to Spain, had like mad fucking deja vu, going to the same hotel, eating at the same restaurant, going to the same racetrack, driving the same drive route, just in a different car. That was real interesting. Um, <laughs> did you get to try a different food at the hotel, or was it the same menu? Uh, everything was the same. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now, it was okay because actually the, I like Seville a lot. The food is fantastic. It's beautiful. Uh, the people who work there, I mean, the ones that I met, people in the, the service industry in Seville, very, very nice people. The fucking roads, dude. The roads there are so good. And it's really weird because, granted, I didn't see the entire city, uh, but I did a lot of walking around and we did a lot of driving around. It seems like there is no car culture there, hmm. which is a real bummer because their roads right outside the city, unreal. I mean, the tarmac, the camber, the views, the elevation changes. We went on like, we drove on like the equivalent, I guess it would be the equivalent of like Angeles Crest mm-hmm. in terms of quality and like no sports cars, no motorcycles. Like, no, there's just. We drove for miles and miles and miles and miles on these roads, and there just wasn't anything there. Like, I don't know how you drive on this road and see no enthusiast vehicles of any kind, especially in a country that takes its leisure as seriously as Spain does. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like, well, Spain, uh, it's not like Southern Europe is like the most industrious part of the world where everyone like is like work, 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 and no play. These motherfuckers take a siesta in the middle of the day. I love it. Day drinking is practically a sport there. Yeah. But like no canyon carving, like no motorcycles, no, and I understand it's not like the richest part of the world, but like no Miatas, no hot hatches, like well, nothing. Well, I think like we, who we were talking to recently that told us that Subarus are very rarely seen in Europe because I think the import, I'm sure there's an mm. import tax reason, right? So but no like, Miata, Japanese cars, you're going to ship them from but Japan. But like no Peugeot uh, 206s, I no, I bet no it, I Fiestas. Bet a, like, well, I think there's probably... Uh, they have an amazing train system, so there's a less incentive. To, like we were talking to the photographer People, yesterday. There's cars fucking everywhere. People drive. No, I People know, but, but I think I think there's knock-on effects. Like uh, the photographer from this, the shoot this week, his yeah. son is 17. Yeah, doesn't have his license yet. They're from Germany, and I said, you know, are you into cars? He's like, no. He's like, I don't. He doesn't need one to get around. You know, it's it's something that he will eventually have, but it's very expensive to get a license, yeah. at least in Germany. And it also, if you don't need it. I think I think 
here the necessity of the car and the culture of the individualism of traveling by yourself kind of intersect and they feed each other. But I think you don't need that to get away from home when you are living in a place with a better train system or walking cities. I think so it's that's, just not there as much. I mean, You're not exposed true, to it. But I but I go when I go to the UK, which they is have called, a huge racing industry. Okay, they, and they've had that for a hundred years. But like, okay, if you go to south of France and you mm-hmm. drive on the Route Napoleon, where there's lots of press launches, there's enthusiast cars and motorcycles like ripping up there. True, but, um, but are they from France? Are they visiting from uh, other places? I, yeah, I, I didn't stop and interview them, but well, but, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm just I was questions. surprised after spending two two different days, hours and hours and hours on these roads. Mm-hmm. You would think I saw one. I agree. I'm talking about. Top 10 global driving roads I've ever driven. Yeah, their tarmac is perfect. Tarmac is Absolutely exceptionally perfect. good. Their roads are cambered properly. The views are great. Um, it was weird. This site says that Spain has the largest network of highways and freeways in Europe with over 17,000 kilometers of roads. Yeah. They also build them uh, to a higher quality than places like the UK. Yeah. The tarmac is exceptional. Yeah. And like people people were definitely driving. There's no shortage of cars, motorcycles, scooters, love scooter culture. Scooter culture is awesome. Um and, and they have public transit, but like people were definitely driving. They just weren't driving anything fun. Mm-hmm. Like I saw I only saw like one boxster, you know, one I saw one like nine six four, but like no affordable sports cars really of any kind no modified cars of any kind and the only sport bikes i saw were being used for like commuting in the city weird hmm. and as a, unfortunately you can't uh ship your own jamon leg home you can't yeah no they fra- you got to get it for, through a commercial importer in america so i could get the same jamon that we were eating there which was just exceptional but it's literally double the price like it was, it was like seven hundred euro for the whole leg, over there. That same leg is like fifteen hundred dollars. And the exchange rate right now is only like one point oh eight, a dollar eight for a euro. So yeah. it's not like a horrible yeah. exchange rate. It's all just import duties and all that kind of shit. How many servings is that leg? Oh, it's a lot. I mean, it's the whole, it's yeah. the whole leg. It's a lot. It's you'd have to, you'd have to have a jamon party. For like fifty people to right. get through it, Jesus. Um, and it doesn't. Once you cut it, it's preserved, you know, on the outside. But once you cut it open, then you've only got like a couple weeks. Clock ticking. A couple weeks, yeah. Oh, a couple weeks, okay. Yeah, but we were looking on the importer. Wow. They do have smaller like chunks you can get, where instead of like seven kilos, it's like two, and it's still expensive compared to what it would be over there. But it's a little more reasonable, and you could get through it in a couple of sittings. Yeah, fifteen hundred dollars on ham. That's just the best ham. You could fly there for less. Not well. Not well, <laughs> but you could fly there yeah, you for could. less. You could. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we're not doing it. Yeah, you get less ham. We're not. But you doing get it. more Sevilla. Yeah, Sevilla. but I was so Sevilla. stressed out the other day that Hannah was like, "I'm gonna get you ham," and she and she, and then she looked and she was like, she was overwhelmed with the choices because there's this place that's like right here in like San Pedro. They import it. And she was like, which one do you want? And I was looking at the prices. I was like, fucking none of these. Wow. Yeah, it was really Damn. expensive. Yeah. It was so good, though. It's so delicious. It's so much different than all. Well, now you have to keep going on the press launches. Right. So you got to keep well, you're your going. You're going to go. I'm going. You're going to go, and you're going to get to have yeah. some come on for Aston Vantage. Yep. And get to drive uh, Circoto de Monte Blanco, which is a really fun track. Uh, I, I felt like a cheat code. Going twice was a, a real big advantage. I'm not going to say anything about the Taycan GT, but shocker, it's fucking fast. I mean, mm-hmm. the 707 Nürburgring time, which is uh, which is between a uh, McLaren 720S and an AMG GTR, uh, or AM... GTR Pro? GTR Pro, AMG okay. GTR Pro. Jeez. It's real fast. It's um, also, the fact that it's only two seconds behind the Nevera, but that that is slower than... Wait, which, you were saying Nürburgring times, right? Or were you it's, saying yes? I was saying times? Nürburgring. No, 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 Nürburgring. So the two GTR Pro is faster than Nevera, is it? On the Nürburgring, yeah. I, I think it's cl- it's close. That's wild. It's real close. Um, but when you're when you're on that track with a really fast car, getting getting some. 
primer lapse in the Panamera from two weeks before was very helpful. Yeah, because then you, you don't were, need to. I knew where I was going. Acclimate yourself. Yeah, we were right up to speed. GTR Pro is a second faster than Nevera. Yeah, on Nurburgring. Yeah. Whew. So I can't talk about Tycon GT until next week, but you could tell that it's fast. That's not even a drive impression. It's fucking the numbers are it's fast, yeah, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, I can talk about the 2024 Rolls Royce Spectre. Yes, that uh, that I spent a week with. Guys, got to take one quick break from the show for Give Me the Vin. Whether you've got a regular car, an exotic car, an old car, a new car, if you want out of it, Give Me the Vin wants it, and you can sell it to them quickly easy and for more money than any of those big box car stores will give you by going to give me the vin.com slash smoking tire that's give me the vin.com slash smoking tire they want to buy your car could be a regular car could be a cool car could be a crappy car it doesn't matter if you've got a car you want out of give me the vin wants it so go to give me the vin.com slash smoking Smoking Tire, just put in your VIN number or your license plate number, and they will make you an offer instantly. You can bring it down to one of their locations, or they'll come pick it up right from your house. It's fast, it's easy, and you can put that money in your pocket by making extra cars go away at GiveMeTheVIN.com slash Smoking Tire. Now, back to the show. Video's not doing that good. I'm guessing it's not a particularly relatable topic. <laughs> Uh, it combines things that people, like, don't want to know about, EVs and really expensive cars that cost as much as houses. So right. I guess that's why it's maybe not not doing so well. But, like, okay, uh, here we are. And uh, it, is <laughs> it is the uh, longest, tallest, and heaviest two-door car on sale in almost 100 years. Is its roof height, how close is the roof height to, like, a crossover? It is uh, one and a half inches shorter than my Mach-E. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite tall. Mm -hmm. And that's the roof of the Mach-E that's not the painted. It's the real the top. Part. The, hot, the Holy top part. Yeah, it's, it's 61 uh, and change tall, the Spectre, and the Mach-E is 63 inches tall. It's uh, it's It's... Very. I mean, look that photo in the the center card, which you can also. I have the same photo on on Instagram of me standing next to the car. I'm six foot three. The fucking thing is up to my shoulders. It's a two door car. I mean, that's not that's, that's true. not a rescaled photo. That is no. I didn't. I did not rescale <laughs> any of that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. A column in height is seventy two inches. I was just right. curious. So the okay. the the, in, the most interesting thing about the, the Spectre, which is a two door car, again is is uh, 600 pounds heavier than a Cullinan, which is the SUV, and it is five and a half inches longer than a Cullinan. So, <laughs> so I mean, and that's, that's like, you know, a Rolls-Royce coupe is supposed to be almost cartoonishly yeah. proportioned. That's like kind of the thing. Is the trunk, is there a lounge in the trunk that you can sit in and hang out? The, the trunk is, it's bit, it's, it's deep. deep. Yeah. It's deep. So okay. you can put like golf clubs and stuff in there. So it's a pretty big trunk. No frunk, interestingly. Well, uh, that's where, well, it looks like there's an engine there. There's not, of course. There's but not. what is, do you know what's under that plastic cover? There's, there's the, like all the HVAC stuff. There's a lot, of a lot of electronics and the battery okay. is like a skateboard, of course. but it does go up into that quote engine bay area as well. And there's like all the HVAC, there's all the cooling, there's all the, all that other stuff is up there. Okay. And I'm guessing because this is not used as a utility vehicle, they didn't spend the money and resources finding ways to make that a frunk. Let me say something about frunks real quick. I'm about to turn in the Ford, three-year lease. Mm -hmm. I have used the frunk how many times? Four. Zero. Wow. Zero times. So mm. for all of the stuff we – now, granted, the, it's, got a, it's got a regular, a nice hatchback trunk. The back seats fold down. So – and it's very rare that I need to carry, like, four people or five people and a whole bunch of shit. Right. It's usually one or the other. Bunch of shit or people. 
So uh, my use case is not data. But for all of the shit that we talk about, whether a car has a frunk or doesn't have a frunk, I have used it zero times. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's a little, when you walk up to the car, the way, you know, the way we park most of the time, you walk up to the back. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's just muscle memory and it's more convenient. And maybe even though your anecdotal story isn't data, they probably, Rolls probably asked their customers, or they just went, let's just keep it traditional. You yeah. Know, no one wants to open the hood and it'll look like you're working on it. Yeah, yeah. You it's not, it it's not elegant. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not elegant. That's true. You know where the Franc was came in handy was in the Lightning, right? The Ford mm -hmm. Lightning, that yes. was like super useful because especially if you don't have a tonneau cover, you have like a secure luggage area. Yeah. And, and it's smaller power so there. things won't roll. Over. Like anytime yeah. I put anything in a truck bed that yeah. doesn't fill the bed, I yeah. hear it at every turn. Yeah, just, yeah. Da -da 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 that's like, crunch. that's real useful. Yeah. But like... Uh, in the, yeah, and I didn't use it. Someone somewhere, I'm sure, does the frunk as a cooler thing in the Maquis. Fill it with the ice. That's a good move. It's got the drain. You could do shrimp cocktail like Ford PR did. Um, so anyway, the Spectre. A couple things about the Spectre. One is, as we talked about this in the show a whole bunch, when you drive an electric Hyundai versus a gas Hyundai, I don't mean to pick on Hyundai, but but almost any electric car versus the gas equivalent, there's a big jump in refinement, perception, perceived refinement, right? Mm -hmm. Drive a fucking Kia Stinger and then a Kia EV6 GT, and you it's the the jump in refinement is enormous, right? Even with a pretty good gas engine, of course. I mean, a V yeah. a V engine has a noticeable vibration, right? And if you remove all of that, you can tell. So with a Rolls Royce. It's already so smooth mm -hmm. that going to EV is only an incremental jump. So the actual driving of the car, the experience is basically the same. There's not, I mean, even before a Rolls Royce only had D. Yeah. Like it, you know, there's no suspension adjustments. There's no sport mode. I'm Maybe. sure the only one of the big differences is the power delivery. It's just a sure. little more instant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. it's instant electric torque. Um, so it does feel quicker than the power to weight ratio, which is the same as a GR Corolla would indicate. It's got a ton of power. It's got a ton of torque, but it's 6,700 pounds. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. Corolla is 3,300. Just yeah. Not, just under. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like twice the horsepower and, and twice the torque of the Corolla, but it's twice the weight. Of course, it's instant. So it, 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 it feels, you know, shovey. Right. Oh, we should have done that drag race. Oh, the cars weren't here at the same time. Yeah. They were close. Ooh. But um, what's really interesting about it, and Rolls Royce should get credit for this, is that that giant thing has a drag coefficient of 0.25. Damn. Which is really, really good. Yes. I mean, that's a slippery ass. You're, you're that's like it's like Prius like. It's pretty. Uh, Prius might be slightly better, but it's like pretty close to Prius. That uh, wow, Lucid is. Point one nine seven. Yeah, the Lucid is, I think, the slipperiest car on sale. Oh, let me look up Prius right now. I don't know what the new Prius is. It might be really low, low What's twos. The, the last Prius, I think, was like two five. Uh, the last generation was point two four. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's. I mean, look, you're talking about a Rolls Royce that's that looks like a Rolls Royce. It doesn't look like some blob. No. Yeah. And it's and it's that's pretty good. It has so a stout profile. Yeah. You know? they, they've done a great – like the old ones that had the totally flat face. Yeah. It's very subtle the way they've, they've curved it back. I parked it next to a Wraith. Our mm -hmm. client here has a Wraith. And compared to a Wraith, it is slightly inelegant. Hmm. It's a little bulbous. The nose is a little more pinched on this than the Spectre, yeah. than on the Wraith. I think the Wraith looks better, but – I, you know, when you are got to get that arrow, I, I understand why they made the choices they made. Um, the That whole, like, Starfield ceiling with the LEDs and the doors and all that stuff is just amazing. It's so, yeah. So the Wraith is the Wraith has got a little more, It's a, I think the Wraith is a little better looking. And also it looks small, frankly, compared to the, they have roughly the same interior dimensions. Like the the headroom, the leg room, all wow. that stuff. Because when you have that skateboard battery, it takes you've, up a you've lot got of room. to hide it. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing just gets taller. But but you're but it's all so the the Spectre is like a wraith wearing lifts in its shoes, mm -hmm. like, right? It's like you just lift the whole mm -hmm. bottom of the car and you kind of hide it, and that you lift the whole thing up and then just add to the bottom. Yeah, you know. 
It's like wearing a yeah. it's like a wraith wearing a skirt. I definitely like the headlights more on this, even though they are exactly like a three hundred. Yeah, um, they are. But I think the lights on the on the Spectre, I just I just don't like. And a lot of companies are doing this with this sort of the split du- double decker split light, mm-hmm. but there's an empty floor in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, it's not my favorite aesthetic Rolls Royce. Being inside it is pretty amazing. Yes, like, it is. I felt like. I felt like a real shitbag driving this thing around for a week. I really did. I actually felt, like, guilty. Even though it's not mine, I still felt guilty. But, like, the very last night I had it, I went to Hollywood to see Christian's show. Christian, by the way, Christian, our friend Christian Han, just signed his podcast deal with All Things Comedy, which is Bill Burr's comedy. Nice. Movie. So the, the session podcast. Fantastic. Finally, after Fanal- so finally. many years of legal battles, the session podcast is coming soon. Very excited about that. And if we do the podcast tour, this one entire podcast tour, we're going to do it with Christian as a double feature. So that'll be really fun. Um, but the last night I had the Spectre, I went to Christian's show in uh, Hollywood. And I was driving home from Hollywood at like 1130 at night. And I'm like, roll. It's a, it's a warm night. I'm rolling down the 101. The, there's not a lot of traffic on the road because it was like a Sunday night. I had all the windows down. I had the fucking massage heated seats going. I they were playing um, the the U two at the Sphere. Uh, where they were playing the live show that I was at on Sirius. Fucking crank the shit out of it. The 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 interior like Starfield lights were going, and I felt like the king of the universe. Yeah. That they do was, make you feel that way. That was what it was. In traffic, when people are, like, staring at you, I'm like, ah, I don't like this at all. But on the highway, in the dark, by yourself, I was, like, steam train fucking going. I, I felt nice. that way when we had the Bentley, the Speed. Yeah. And I drove it down to Newport. And uh, better stereo in that car than, than the Spectre, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. Much better. Much better. But same thing. It's like, if remove... My my thoughts of society and and the, the cost of this car and everything yeah. as a as just a driving experience, it is a wonderful thing right. to just fly down the road in something that is engineered specifically for that and yeah. to deliver you the best experience possible and then does that. Yeah, well, that's why I wanted like everyone I knew to try this Rolls Royce because like you have to you have to know what it's like to drive because it's totally unique. Mm-hmm. And I try to remind myself that like the people who engineered it can't afford it. So like, let's. I can respect the engineering and the creativity and the thought process and the attention to detail. And like those people aren't the problem. <laughs> the people building it, they're not the problem. They can't afford these fucking things. Um, but like, it's it's really like, it's just a very unique thing to be in something where smoothness overall mm-hmm. and like this sort of like. Everything has this glow to it that's really – that the doors, the LED interior door panels. Go back to the picture further back with the the – star. go go down the Starfield – there, the, the Starfield ceiling. So the Starfield ceiling has a shooting stars that go across it, like <laughs> animated shooting stars. Jeez, I never saw that. Yeah, it's sick. And then roll, scroll to the right. The door – that door part – it's not a great photo, but, like, you get the idea. Those are all individual fiber optics. I mean, it's it's not like there's one light behind a panel with holes in it. It's not like light bright. They're individual <laughs> fiber optics. How about that light bright reference? Good call. Uh, wow. So I, I actually, fuck, I've, I'm, I'm getting old. I should have brought my glasses to read this because here, here's the, spe- here's the option sheet. Find some of your no, favorite, no. your favorite options on there because they are, this was a, this, the base price is what, 400 and... Uh, four hundred twenty thousand okay. dollars. And this one was how much? Five five eight. Yeah. So the Spectre launch package is twenty two grand. Yeah. And that comes with the illuminated tread plate that says Spectre, for <laughs> example. The illuminated grill. Um, the illuminated grill is weird, and I'm glad I can't see it while I'm driving. It's oh not, yeah. It's not good. Uh, let's see, thirteen thousand dollars for that exterior color. Oof. Yeah. They call- I actually like the exterior color. The exterior green is nice. If it had a better interior color, I think it's actually a good color. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I would go with something else, but the interior color is very weird. It's not what I would choose, but I, it was a pleasant exterior color. Um, nice green. Arrow two-tone. 
I don't know what that is, but that's twenty eight thousand dollars exterior styling. That's the that's to have the top painted a different color because it was green with black. Oh, it was. I would say it's too subtle. For twenty eight grand. For twenty eight grand, I I barely <laughs> noticed, and I think go the, go back to the picture. You can, you'll see it. Which car you had the flying spur? That go back, was... look there. That you can't tell that. You oh, didn't like this. Notice? I thought you meant. I it's... think that over here it's shaded. Yeah. No, this... no, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's oh, true. Oh, the hood black is twenty eight thousand dollars. It's the hood and the roof. No, please. Yes. No, please. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> and the lower and the lower valance. Hood, roof, lower valance. No. Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but yeah, twenty eight Absolutely not. Yeah. Camaro owners right now are going. <laughs> You know, they give us that for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right in the RS. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> my neighbor, uh, shout out to David. My neighbor bought a C6 Corvette off his buddy, and and it's a it's like a mint C6 Corvette, super low miles, but got it really cheap out of his buddy's storage unit. Why? Because his girlfriend fucking keyed a huge cock onto the hood like a giant dick. His current Te- girlfriend or ex? His ex girlfriend. There you go. Keyed a giant dick under the hood and now David just took the hood and had it wrapped black and now he's rolling around in a silver vet with a wrapped black yeah, hood that's it fine. Yeah. that's fine 500 bucks easy done. solution yeah. uh, those doors you like so much are $13,000 the star, what do you mean? The starlight. Oh, the starlight doors? Starlight doors yeah. 13000 I mean look in the context of Rolls Royce options get that one the starlight yeah. doors I, it's hard for me to say any option is worth $13,000 but those make me feel fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Whereas a two tone paint job, I could I could go without that. And I think well, because a lot of these cars is presence, yeah. both exterior, and then you open the door for somebody. Yeah. Here you go. The star the star doors is a is a major wow factor, much more so than a two tone paint job. Uh, the stereo mm-hmm. is eleven grand, and it's not worth it. It's not. It's no. really thin. It's, it's the it's sound n- is thin. I. Okay. By far, to me, the most disappointing attribute of this car was the stereo. Yeah. It just did. It, a car like this should have a fucking a thing that blows my blows me away. Yes. Either with power or with clarity. And this didn't do either. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Name in the Bentley is where it's at. Or Meri- or the Meridian in the Range Rover. That one is amazing. That's where you it's know, anything at. Anything that feels like it surrounds you. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, surrounds yeah. Like you should who's hear doing the – Who's doing the um, – Acura, by the way. That stereo oh, is e, one is of the best. Is it ELS? I think it's ELS. ELS it's and way, Acura. It sounds way better than this one. Yeah, for like in like a $70,000 MDX or yep. something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lots of uh, lots of options. It's expensive. This. Interestingly, this one has the 23-inch wheels. You get 50-mile more range if you get the 22s instead, and it would probably look better – and it would prob it would definitely ride better because the ride is really good, but e- but it, now we're it, it's the ride is amazing by the standards of all cars, right? Because it's a fucking Rolls. Of course, it yeah. rides amazing. Of course, there's no mm-hmm. pictures of these things without rims on them. But um, well, I searched 22 inch wheels, so of oh, course, yeah, yeah, that's a tough search term. Yeah, but um, but uh, maybe if you build if you go to RollsRoyce.com and build your own Spectre. Uh, I don't know. The, all, I bet all the press cars yeah. have twenty threes right. for photography purposes. But um, if you get, but like the only thing you really ever feel is those hard edges on the expansion joints, and it's you can't get around it because mm-hmm. heavy car, big rims. It's just that's how math works. But if you got the twenty twos, you get better range and probably better ride quality. But you'd have to floss a little less, I suppose. Holy shit, they've got a fucking Rolls, a 2024 Rolls at O'Gara that's $734,000. Look at that third one from the left on the sponsored posts. Let's make O'Gara pay for that click. Fuck me. Whoa. 2020, I mean, it's a 2024 Phantom long wheelbase, Ooh. matte black, big ass rims, $734,000. What? God damn. What is the uh, 22s? Those are the 22s. Forge. <laughs> yes, that's what the 22s are. Those, yeah. those would look great on the fucking Spectre. Contrast. I mean, this thing looks tough as hell. It does. What is the inside like? 700 grand. 700 Gs. Woof. That's a ton. Black and white interior. There's, this is like some Yakuza shit. The, uh, Jeez. On the, and on the, you know, so on the one hand, it's, it's, it makes all the sense in the world, right, for a Rolls Royce to be electric because... They're already torquey, they're already heavy, they're already quiet, they're already smooth, and that's what electric is. 
So it makes total sense. But on the other hand, there's not much of a difference in experience driving from going from a gas one to an electric one. It's pretty much the same vibe. Um, but uh, that's the Spectre. Uh, go watch the video, please. I could We could really use some more views. Oh, those are the 22s? Those are the 22s. Well, they look nice. They do. I think those look better. Yeah, I mean, granted, this is a rendering, but if I switch to 23s, it, it's just more rubber band. Yeah, the 23s are... It's just thinner sidewall. Yeah. yeah. The 22s look fine. Yeah, I would just go with the 22s. Yeah. 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 Um, whoever said 22s were too fucking big, too small anyway, right? I mean, it's the times we live in now. That yeah. used to be the biggest rim available. That, I know. That'd be total aftermarket. Yeah. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very neat thing, that car. It's really interesting. I, I did enjoy my week with it most <clears> of the time. But, now, man, now that I look at a Wraith, that looks great. Wraiths are awesome. And also incredibly smooth to drive. Yeah. I don't have any range anxiety. Yeah. No. I have two clients here who have Wraiths, and both of them have driven Spectres, and neither wanted to trade their Wraith in for the Spectre. Even a Wraith is a wraith is like a great value compared to a Spectre. <laughs> Just saying. How much is a Wraith now? A used one? Yeah. Middle, middle twos, That's maybe? the problem with, I mean, Rolls-Royce, they, they depreciate so much. They do. You can get a Phantom for under 100 now, and yeah. you will ride Early Phantom. better than almost mm. any other $100,000 car out there. Remember like when Harris years. bought one for like five minutes? Uh, yeah. Harris bought an 04 Phantom and like couldn't sell it fast enough. He also had he also owned a car for a little while that's on my list of, from our, our main topic of top five luxury cars. Oh, should we get which, to that? Uh, we can't if you're done with your list, but. I don't have anything else about the Spectre. Okay. Spectre was interesting but every other car i've driven uh since our last show i really can't talk about because of embargoage um uh, i mean i had the gunther yeah. speedster again but we've already talked about that uh had a 750 and already, we don't want to scoop already, ourselves already covered the... that with the with the road and track issue mm -hmm. but uh and we had the did, well yeah i mean that's really it right well we have the comparison videos coming out in a little bit we do but, but like we should we should, we let should people watch those let people watch those M3 first and M3. then we can discuss about them yeah. the m3 versus m3 and then the um brz ts versus the corolla uh, gr on the track oh street and track actually i forgot we did yeah street, we did a little street we stuff. did a little street stuff didn't we uh but yeah inspired by the rolls royce specter today's main topic is the top five luxury cars of all time. You, this is where we lose everybody. <laughs> well, I would say that most of mine you can get uh, deeply on the used market. So oh, your, most of aggressively. yours are depreciated? I, I went with uh, older cars okay. yeah, for the most part. I have uh, only only one of mine can you really get depreciated. Most, most of the other ones, because I, I really use the term all time. All time. Pretty liberally. Oh well, there's. We're, is this that funny thing where if you go back 20 years, it's cheap. If you go back 70 years, it's yes. very expensive. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Well, we can talk about that too. I didn't go that old, and yeah. I, have, I have a reason. Okay. Well, why don't you start? Uh, all right. Opening uh, Salvo 2011 Bentley Mulsanne. Mm. Um, that's basically the car that Those Harris are owned. Excellent. Uh, we had one as a press car back yeah. during the car show, so of course that memory stuck with me. It rode nice it sounded tough but didn't sound like an ls engine tons of space inside so this replaced the arnage this yeah, is 2011 this six and three quarter twin turbo this yeah. is the last of the old school engine that is in my bentley 500 horsepower yeah 752 pound feet of torque yeah, at 1800 right. rpm things like yeah. a diesel yeah um but most notably it was seven inches longer between the wheels than the Arnage. So it had way more interior space. I mean, just look at, like this thing had so much rear leg room. We drove up, I think all four of us with like fat in the back seat. It was, you know, yeah. plenty of space. I just, I love the interior compared to the Rolls Royce at the time. I like the wood and the dials. And there was more plastic everything in the is, Rolls than I expected. Everything is like diamond stitched. Yes, yeah. or like chromed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just thought it looked tough as hell and it rode nice and it felt fast even though it isn't really. Zero to 60 is five seconds. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's that's, quick that's for something that's that heavy. But Yeah, but the zero to 60, like, it's also like, that's like a launch, yeah. you know, this thing. It's, but it's squatted when you yeah. floored it. It sounded tough. You know, it's just awesome. It's almost the size of a Suburban, but I just yeah. love it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, mine, uh, mine actually was 
from the other press car we used for this shoot, the 2010 Rolls-Royce Phantom Coupe, That's... which uh, I just wrote uh, an article about for the issue of Road and Track that's out now. Um, if you're wondering why I was writing a fucking article about a 2010 Phantom Coupe, it was 221 inches long, which is six more inches than the Rolls Spectre. It's actually longer than the Spectre, although it was a thousand pounds lighter than the Spectre because it didn't have a giant battery. So there's the, the, the Phantom four door, there's the two door Phantom drop head, which is the convertible, and then the rarest variant is actually the Phantom Coupe. Is this one? That's it. Yep. Look at that. Price, what is this? Uh, this It's listed as a million dollars? In Australia. Oh, in Australia. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, they're, they have held their value very well because they are exceptionally rare. Rolls-Royce only made about 100, 150 of these a year for two years. Whoa. So there's, there's, not, there's not a thousand of these out there. Um, they are so fucking dope. Uh, it's it is the it is one of the it, I think it's the longest two door car uh, when it was made it was the <laughs> longest two door car in seventy years. What was the longest before that? One well, it's on my crazy list. nineteen twenty on my okay. list. Yes, um, I have a feeling I know where we're headed. You're yeah, like a Delahaye or something. That, you know. <laughs> you're not. Yeah, you're not far off. But this thing was yeah two door suicide door four seater and and. Uh, just super fucking pimp in a way that even the the Wraith, I don't think, can keep up with Jeez. in terms of sheer pimping. Look at the length from headlight to the hinge of the front door. Good well, so, God. So this is a great photo. Uh, we're looking at the car broadside here. And, and one of the defining characteristics of luxury is what they call the dash to axle ratio, right? And it's the distance between the dashboard and the front axle. Mm -hmm. And... In, in a true luxury car, that should be long. That's a long measurement. Well, you succeeded. Yes. And part of the reason that a lot of people don't like the Bentley Bentayga, for instance, or some of the other, uh, the, the, Continent, the first gen Continental Flying Spur, or the, the Phaeton based cars, mm -hmm. is because they're on Volkswagen architecture, they don't have that long dash to axle ratio when they switched oh, uh, put in like early, 2006 yeah. flying spur when they switched to the panamera architecture so yeah look at that so tiny so the dash to axle it's like it might as well be a jetta and you see they've accentuated it by by having a long schnoz in front of the front axle yeah so they've made the car longer by doing that but it's all in the front the it's overhang is correct huge. the overhangs are really big whereas here it's tiny right. right there's yeah they move the axle forward and then they don't have to have a long front overhang man they should have had a longer door though it looks like i mean i'm sure this door is that long, door is like seven but feet it, long. but it looks too short <laughs> door is so to long right here yo you can't park that car next to anything because the door is fucking huge <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 2010 Phantom Coupe. They were about 500 Gs when they were new in 2010. And I bet to get one now is still probably in the threes. Jeez. Yeah. And they will be very, very collectible in the, in the long term. Yeah. They're rad. All right. Mine, classic. Oh. Probably on yours as well. The crossover has happened. Yes. 1990 LS400 yep. from Lexus. That one looked exactly like the one my dad had, which became mine. Which was and this 91. looks exactly like the one we had for a while. No, we, ours was a 96. Well, I mean, so the color is like The color is the same. and the, close. Uh, but it, the 96 was the dot two version of this, so it had a slightly less curvy Arsha. Slightly less curvy mm. and, a, and a slightly different wheel design. But, yeah, very similar. I mean, I like the later generation style-wise. I think the early 2000s were my favorite, mm -hmm. which is true for a lot of the, the cars. The 430s, LS430s? Uh, well, wait, wait. Let me look it up. Because there was one where they went to really tall headlights that I think looked like garbage. And then it got nice and sleek. And... I mean, either way, Oops. there's no uh, denying... The impact of the LS 400. Because it think wasn't this is my, just... Yeah, this is my favorite style of the year. Oh, those. Oh, the 2010 one? Yeah, I like the okay. 2010s. Yeah, those are good. But I, I put the 1990 on there because, as you just said, the impact. Yeah. I mean, it may, it was the biggest, best competitor to the S-Class. It brought a bunch of new technology into things. Mm -hmm. Passive air ride suspension. A lot of tech inside. Did not have air ride. It's, one of them had an optional passive air ride. Uh, 
maybe in Japan, maybe, maybe the Japan. Celsius. The U.S. spec ones passive. did not have air ride. I don't know what passive. What is passive air ride? I think it means not high adjustable. If I had to guess, I'm uh, guessing maybe yeah. But I uh, Lexus uh, the U.S. spec Lexus LS 400s did not have air suspension. Oh, that was in Japan. Yeah, maybe a Celsius did along with like the massage seat. They also had stuff. something that was sort of funny because I found I found this exact term on 20 sites, but I had, could find zero explanations for what it meant. Huh. A lot of copy paste. Uh, fluid damped cabin fixture. Fluid damped cabin, cabin fixture. fixture. It was in, it's in Wikipedia. It's in 15 car blogs that talk about why the LS was so good uh -huh. and no one explained what it was. So if someone's listening and knows what that means, fluid damped please cabin comment. fixture. Yeah. They said it was one of the things that added to how quiet it was in the cabin. Hmm. But I really want to know what that means. Like, are the buttons filled with hydraulic bump stops? Yeah. You know, what is yeah. that? Uh, it's one weird. of the first sedans with tilt, telescope, wheel, automatic. It had memory uh -huh. seats. The seating position in this thing was amazing. Yeah. The visibility is amazing. Yep. It's obviously super reliable. You could drive it for decades without having an issue. Well, this, there was more money forward. invested in this car than any other car in history before it. And it was true a true spared no expense car. And uh, you can put the engine in an aircraft and get it FAA certified. You can... Run them for a million miles. They are, they are superior. Mm -hmm. Superior automobile. I'm with you on that. Uh, all right, good one. How about the 1987 Mercedes 560 SEC 6.0 Hammer? Hmm. Now, now is this a luxury car? Because I feel like this was included on a previous list we did about like. Euro tuner cars. Yeah. Yeah. I, I it could be that. Let's go to the top right. That's that's kind of where I'm at there. Yep. I I think this is a luxury car. I think it's a high performance car, but it's definitely not a sports car. Uh it could be a tuner car, yes. It I mean it is it it mm -hmm. pre merger AMG, technically a tuner car. But uh I think I think this is a high-speed uh, autobahn burning luxury car. It's definitely not a sports car. No, I, I I think you're right. I think this is there's an overlap between GT and luxury car, which yeah. like the Bentley Continental now, yeah. you know, is really good at that. So this is like that, but just yeah. back in the day. Yeah, okay. this this I mean maybe it would be on a list of GT cars rather both. than luxury cars. And I did sort of question if you want if you want to go luxury cars, we could go instead of 560 SEC 6.0. Hammer, we go 560 SEL 6.0 Hammer, which was the sedan. That was the full the full size. Just change that C to an L, and you end up exactly where you think you end up. Yes, look at that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good. Would I spend my money on it? Maybe not. Not necessarily my vibe, but that is the same powertrain and the same fucking bits in the full sizer. And still looks great today. It's very tough. I mean, yeah. the, the SEC is sick. Yeah. It is sick. I'm, so. I mean, if you put the wide body on the SEL, that would look Ooh. real cool. Kaiza. Yeah. Do some rendering. Get at me, bro. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a 385 horsepower V8, uh, redone interior, body kit, unbelievable monoblock wheels, upgraded brakes, all that good stuff. And this was like, you know, this was a full-size sedan that was like 160, 170 mile an hour sedan in the 80s. Damn. So... Yeah. That's incredibly fast for back yeah. then. Flying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, uh, keeping in, in, things in the family, uh -huh. I go 2017 S X63. S63. Uh, 2018, they got some upgrades, but one thing they got rid of was the cruise control stock. 2018 is when they started using those haptic buttons on oh, the steering yeah. wheel. That's no So good. I looked that up first, and I pulled back, and I changed back to 2017 because those are really, really annoying. Yeah. But... You, in my opinion, you could put almost any S class of any generation on this list. Obviously, like they created, they made the benchmark. They yeah. keep moving it. They keep moving the bar higher and higher. I just like this one because I think the dash design at this time was great. You had those four round vents underneath the, the screens. Mm -hmm. Looked very kind of jet age, but modern. It had modern screens, adaptive cruise. I mean, it was. It's it's where. It's before things turned into an iPad interior. Yeah, and that's what I like. I also like the styling. Fast enough, handles great, enough tech. You know, I, for, so for me, I didn't want to include a lot of older luxury cars because I want to have as many features as possible without encroaching on how I drive. Sure. So that's why I went with like, let's go modern safety, modern speed, 
modern driving dynamics. And so I kept it more in like the 90s, 2000s. Yeah, I, mine, I sort of, I, I made them like of their time, not necessarily like with 2024 standards applied. Mm. You know, fair, whatever. Um, yeah, but that's why we don't discuss these things before. Yeah, it's we, more fun. <laughs> no, but it's more fun that way to see what we what we choose for this. I I had the the nineteen ninety seven ninety eight S six hundred the W one forty on there, uh, and then I changed my mind and went to the to the hammer because it was just a little sillier. Like I thought about putting a sixties Cadillac on here, and then yeah. I realized that. I would be nervous driving that down the road because I'd wonder if it's going to break, and yeah. that doesn't feel luxurious to me anymore. Sure, you but know? in the '60s, in the '60s, you're the king. But yeah. right now, I'm like, what would I want to have, or what would I shop sure. for? Sure, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, speaking of the '60s, let's go to the '50s. Yeah, uh, Continental Mark II. The Continental Mark II was uh, one of those Fords that they didn't want to call a Ford. They, uh, it was a Lincoln they didn't want to call a Lincoln. They didn't call it a Ford or a Lincoln. It was so good they called it its own thing. And um, they made these for two years. Um, they they still look awesome, if you ask me. It's a fin it's an amazing, beautiful car. Looks like a longer T bird, which is a compliment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, T birds are real small. Yes, T birds they are. look big in photos, but are actually really small mm -hmm. when you're standing next to one. Yeah, they're like it's like sitting in a Mustang with yeah. no back seat. So this was you know Ford wanted to make a run at a proper European style luxury car, and they didn't just style it like that they they spared no expense the cars are built by hand um, they use Lincoln powertrains but the Lincoln engines were built by hand they were balanced and blueprinted so they were perfectly smooth the the leather uh, you know American cars were like air like airbrushed leather to change the color these were like vat dyed in Scotland like proper proper uh the way that they would mm. do it for rolls royce or for bentley um they came up with an entirely new um industry leading uh quality control process just for this car the interiors are, are quite beautiful actually they're not like oh look at the switches yeah the switch the switches are are rad yeah the top look at those, wow. see those hvac controls I mean, that's Those are like pimp. airplane levers, yeah. controllers. You know, yeah, just they're right. Push forward for throttle, yes. push back for heater. Wood slam on bags, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they used, they, they, they went to Europe and learned all these sort of old world uh, craft sort of techniques, and they applied them to this. And uh, yes. Ooh, that's dope. Isn't that great? With and then this, they, like cloth, pa not paisley, but like flower print orange. Like like your grandma's seat, sofa. But gray and orange, this is cool. Yeah. Wow. And then they did, I mean, look. Even look at if that. You, look at those gauges. They look great. That one on the left with the four inside the gauge, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, that looks like a nice watch. It looks like an Icopod. It's beautiful. And then zoom out on this photo. And then if you notice where this photo is taken, in the background of this photo is a, uh, a Bentley uh, Continental T, and then like a pre-war fucking Bugatti. So this thing is in, is in some kind of company in its collection yeah. there. Um, Oof, those are. Look at the door. The door handles are those big like the door pulled pole. like yeah. airplane throttles. That's so cool. Yeah. So I really love this car. This is I. I don't like a lot from the fifties. The fifties is kind of a. Not I, I know why people like 50s cars, but I don't really like 50s cars that much. But I, I love the Continental Mark II. And in case you're wondering why they didn't, uh, what happened? Well, they took the Continental name and then just applied it to a Lincoln. They did two years and then they're like, you know what? We can't print money with this. This mm -hmm. car is too nice. It costs too much money. And it's got a Ford badge and on it. Yeah, let's just take a regular ass Lincoln, take all that brand credibility we've built up by building this amazing car, and then just burn it to the fucking ground. <laughs> That's what Ford does. How much are these now? Uh, you can, uh, 50 to 150. Okay. You can get into a, a driver grade one for 50, 60 grand. A, a Concours ready one is middle, middle six figures. I mean, they're not cheap, uh, but they're very, very dope. Let's see if I can. Oh, well, that's gonna be all over the place. Huh? Okay. There's always a few for sale. Is there a bunch? No, no. When I typed, I just typed in Ford Mark II, hoping it would be quick, and oh, it's like, here's all the Ford Con GTs. Continental you want to buy. Mark II. Yeah, yeah. Continental Mark II, not Ford Escort. Or, it doesn't say know. Ford anywhere on this fucking thing, or Lincoln. As uh, Lincoln, it only says Lincoln on the hood ornament. Fifty-one thousand dollars. Yeah. Not bad for yeah. for decent. 
Um, this is the first one I found, classiccar.com. I bet oh, now I bet now is a is a good time to buy one of these things. I bet it is. Come on. Oh yeah, look at that. Here we go. Twenty five grand. Let's see that really nice one. That nice black with the white walls. What else is there? Oh, there's a whole bunch. Uh, so there's ninety grand frame off restoration. So Ooh. yeah, that seems they've they've come down. This is nice. Right? I'd okay, change we'll those to, wheels, but that's a, good, that's a good one. Black, yeah. 51 grand. I mean, you're getting something pretty that's a awesome. a very cool looking car. Yeah, right? I like the shape of the greenhouse a lot. Yeah. Oh, man, this trunk is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, with the spare tire in the trunk. Let's see the interior. But it's molded in instead of being sitting yeah, on the outside, yeah. which is nice. Well, they cheapified it later, huh? So this one's got white leather with, uh, with black inserts. Uh, oh, sorry. Those are dark red. Oh, they're dark yeah. red. Sorry. Colorblind. Colorblind kicking me. I would take those dark red inserts out and do that exact cloth thing like they were doing in the other one. That'd be sweet. Yeah. These are such cool cars. It's really pretty clean. Big ass V8. Mm. Yeah. Blah, 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 that one looks like it's in good shape, too. 50,000 bucks, huh? Oh, good. Another thing for me to spend money on. I was going to say. You got a sixth job. <laughs> <laughs> like, you haven't bought a car in a minute. I know, right? It's, it's been what like do you mean? two months. Two whole months. <laughs> right. Fuck. Look, you're walking, letting one Ford go. You should get another I was walking around one. the fucking garage going the, the other day going, what do I sell? I might want to sell something. It's also not a bad yeah, idea. I know. Um, all right, what else you got? My fifth one is a is any Porsche Cayenne. I actually. Just, just the Cayenne? The Cayenne. I think I think it's the best combination. Like, it, it will drive... It'll be fun to drive up a mountain road because mm -hmm. they, they get the ergonomics right, they get the steering right, they get the performance is fine. And then when you want to go off-roading or if it starts snowing, it's lifted, it has a good four-wheel drive system. And, and the first-gen ones, I know they're very popular for the overlanding stuff and like Joey Seeley, a motion engineering style. But, um, and, they, and then later generations, they kind of reduced the budget mm. of the diffs and mm. whatnot, but I don't want to uh, offer one not, anyway. I think, that, I don't think that's fair. I think they realize most most their customers preferred on-road dynamics to off-road capability. Which, which I do as well. And yeah. if I was going to buy and build an off-road vehicle, I wouldn't do it with something this expensive and complicated. Yeah. I'd go Forerunner or whatever. Yeah. So to me, that's not a problem. But I just think as an overall vehicle that can take you anywhere, and I think that is a luxury to be able to like drive a thousand miles on highway then go through the snow then go through mud and then go on a camping trail if you want to all in a very comfortable seat mm -hmm. with very good ergonomics yeah. and good performance i don't yeah. think there's a better car i i don't have a real argument for that cayennes are good my dad's been in now in his third cayenne and loves it very much and i had one for a week over thanksgiving last year and for a road trip with the family and lovely right lovely all right uh, consumer advice there. My number five, the Bugatti Type 41 Royale. Uh, they built seven. Um, there are six remaining. It uh, was 252 inches long. A Suburban is 220 inches long. So this was three feet longer than a Suburban. <laughs> the article that has this picture is called the world's most expensive yep. car. It, it also is the world. It is, it, it is the world's most expensive car. None have Wait. none have changed hands uh, in the last in, in any recent history. The last time one did change hands at auction, it went for six times the price of a Ferrari GTO at the time. Six. Wait, wait, what year was that? When did that change? It was hands? like 25 years ago. Okay. So what? one of these sold for like $40 million when GTOs were like, you know, $6 million. So GTOs are now worth 10 times that. Yeah, so it's yeah. possible. It's possible this is still the world's most expensive car. Good. Uh, Lord. It's, it's 252 inches long, it is 7,000 pounds, and it has a 12.7 liter inline eight. Um, it has the, a dash to axle ratio measured in miles. Yeah. Uh, the wheels are 24s. Okay. And they had planned to build 25 of them, but they only built seven. And the engines that were going to go in the other, uh, whatever, 17 that they didn't make uh, went to SCNF. Do you know what that is? No. It's a railway. They powered trains. The engines, the, the engines they didn't use. Is it SNCF? SNCF, whatever it is, it went to the fucking French railway. 
That's it went what, to a train. Not, it didn't get transferred on a train. It, no, it was the it train. Powered it powered a train. It powered a train. Good and God. And so uh, all, all of them had individual coach work done. Well, yeah, like this one, it, you know, chauffeur in the front with yeah. open roof and yeah. then covered in the back. But then if we go back to Google, you've got... There's like a like, two-seater like one. A drop there's like a roadster one, one. Yeah. If you go to the the Wikipedia for this, this go to the cool. go to the Bugatti Royale Wikipedia. There it is, top corner. Doop, doop. Oh, it just went away. Yeah. Go to, go to the Wikipedia page, and it actually because there's only fucking seven. There's if you scroll down, there are incredibly detailed uh, photos as well as descriptions of each one. So they're all they're all super different because they all had totally different coach work. Some of them are Jeez. like way better looking than other ones. Like the Cabriolet Weinberger mm -hmm. is not really that cool. No, but this but, one. But looks the Coupe de Ville awesome. Binder is bitchin', and uh, the Limousine Park Ward. So, so it's pretty. They're <laughs> this is pretty ridiculous. Like, oh, this is weird. Yeah. Oh. SNCF, oh yeah, SNCF, French yeah. National Railway. So there's there's the the trains. Let's see to utilize the engines. Bugatti built a rail car powered by either two or four of the engines. Seventy nine rail cars. Wow, did one hundred and twenty two miles an hour in the thirties, mobbing. Yeah, and then there's been a couple of uh, replicas built uh, later. But you ever seen one of these in person? It's unbelievable. Can you imagine going 122 miles per hour in a fucking train in 1958? <laughs> yeah. People were afraid that you, like, if you stood up on a motorcycle, that you'd die. Yeah. That wasn't that long after they thought if you went over 100 miles per hour, you would explode. Yeah. They thought that, that would happen to the human body. Yeah. That is wild. Isn't that crazy? 200 horsepower uh, per engine. So yeah. a train with, yeah. what, four engines? Yeah. Whoa. Cool, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's... Good Possibly fine. the most luxurious car uh, ever built. Um, yeah. Yep. Sorry, do you know what they cost? Oh, wait, I misread that. Uh, the, wait, hang on. When they went to market in the 19th. Yeah. That's a weird, no, that's a weird, that sentence is weird. Which? I, it's right above the word design. When they went to market in the 1980s, they sold for the price of more than six Ferrari 250 GTO. I think that should not be taken seriously, that claim, because it's written in not real English, mm. and I don't know what it's actually referring to. So pretend I didn't say that. Sorry. Whatever it was about the six GTOs, that could be total bullshit. Did I don't he, know. He's weighed 7,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. They're box. They're the frames are box steel. Yeah, I guess yeah, and they're and they're longer than anything. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah. Whoa. The wheelbase is 170 inches, and the and the length is 252 inches. The car is 20 percent longer than a new Phantom. <laughs> a new Phantom. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, right? That's yeah. Imagine three pointing that thing for a photo shoot. Hey, no, no overhand though. This this is like a Hummer. This could go yeah, up a, yeah. a vertical wall. Yeah, the first thing that hits you is tire. Damn. Crazy, right? That's a cool looking car. Yeah, Bugatti Royale with motherfucking cheese. That's excellent. Uh, that's our main topic for the day. Get in Damn. the comments if you've got ones that you think we fucked up or could do better with. Uh, we want to hear from you and let's. Speaking of hearing from you, let's go to the Patreon. If you want to ask questions uh, for the show, if you want to, um, uh, you know, get the shows ahead of time, add free listening experience, uh, early access to merch drops and other stuff, uh, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast is where you do it. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. All the pizza in my belly. Can you comment on the discontinuation of 718 sales in Europe because of cyber security issues? Did you read this story? I read the headline, so I, I don't know the details. I also read the headline that it was for cyber security issues, but I don't really know what that means. What I what I saw, people were saying, like, why can't they just update that? And, and I think the drive did the article, and they said you'd have to re-engineer the entire car. So there's just, I don't know, there's a lot more to that story. But I think... The commenters thought, why can't they just update the computer system and then they can keep selling the car? And it's like, no, they'd have to change a lot more than that about how – I think they'd have to change a lot of the hardware. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's just more complicated than just stopping sale of the car. Yeah. Which is – I mean, they were going to stop it 
soon anyway because of the electric one that's mm-hmm. coming out. So I think it's a bummer. Yeah. Um, but uh, buy one while you can. I mean, I don't think like are they like if there's cars at dealers they can fucking sell them right? It's not like a, it's not like a stop sale. No, it's not a stop sale. It's yeah. just it's it's another yet another regulation in the future that has to be met. Yeah. And they go well. It's too between that and maybe emissions and other things. It's just easier to stop selling the car. Yeah. Yeah. I hope people who uh, who got car. I mean, maybe it'll be better for America. Maybe they'll allocate all those cars that were going to Europe to America, and we'll get a flood of those. Maybe. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I, it probably is not as cheap as you think to fix. It's got to be some other stuff, like most things in cars. It's probably not that simple. Exactly. Yeah. It, if if we can think of it, yeah. the engineers have thought of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Elias Rayford, uh, I'm seeing a few Bentleys going from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars from years two thousand one to two thousand eight. Arnage and Continental Flying Spur. Knowing what you know, would this be a fun second car for road trips and puttering around town on weekend errands? I mean. Listen, I bought a Bentley for $20,000. It immediately needed $12,000 worth of stuff. So I didn't really buy a $20,000 Bentley, did I? And it's, my, my Bentley is not nearly as complicated as an Arnage or a Flying Spur. Flying Spurs have really expensive maintenance costs. Um, and, and also, like, the thing about a like, my car feels like a classic. There's knobs and levers and stuff like that. A 2003 Flying Spur is going to have, like, a shitty screen, Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of, like, first-gen electronic-type stuff. And, like, a really cheap one of those might – it might be pretty shitty. Like, like I don't think that there's a a low-mile, mint-condition – flying spur out there that just happens to be super cheap. I think the ones that are super cheap are going to be pretty janky and have, like, a lot of needs. Now, Arnages, if you get one uh, that is uh, – that is so the thing about Arnages is there's two different engines for them. There's the BMW engine and then there's the, the Bentley engine. You want one with the Bentley engine. You don't want one with the BMW engine. So if you can, if the one, if the generally the cheaper Arnages are the ones with the BMW engine. So if you find a good one with the Bentley engine and you get a good PPI, that one could be cool. Um, you know, Hoovy was here last week. Uh, did he talk about his Arnage on the show, or was uh, that later? Briefly, he did briefly. We talked about it when we were downstairs. He said his Arnage has been really good. Now that's that's an anecdote of one. And Arnages can be really expensive to maintain too. But I think at least. An Arnage with the Bentley engine would be a true Bentley-like driving experience, whereas a early flying spur at this point would pe- feel just like a used car. I mean, they're fast and they're like they're objectively nice, but like a cheap one is probably gonna be pretty janky. It'd be interesting to test like an Arnage versus a modern Genesis uh-huh. and see. What, you know, like close your eyes and see how the rides are similar because suspension technology has advanced. And wonder, I wonder if they've gotten closer to where really nice cars were 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, the door closing might feel more solid. The cars might be heavier. Mm-hmm. But from an actual experience, you might not actually be getting something that interesting except when you get out and look at it. Yeah. Uh, David says, what car do pop-up headlights ruin the lines and looks of the car the most? Then throws out the Toyota 2000 GT. I mean, all of them. Yep. All pop-up headlights are ruin the car for me. When they're up, right? When they're down, that's how the car is supposed to look. And when they're up, it's no good. GT, I would say, is one of the worst only because it's such a sleek shape. Uh, The Porsche 928, when they pop up, like, from behind... You know those? Oh yeah, the one. I mean, the ones that lay down. Yeah. And pop up. Yeah, I don't like those at all. Yeah. The 2000 GT looks proper shit with them up. <laughs> I realize this is like Forza re- rendering, but, but you get the you idea. Know, yeah. That's accurate. It looks. It looks like garbage. Yeah, it's a very sleek car. The ones, yeah. yeah. They all look bad. Um, I mean, all of them. So it's literally all of them look bad. I can't think of one. Maybe, like, like, 
My Countach is better than some because when it pops up, it's then got the two round lights in there, mm-hmm. which kind of changes the vibe like a little bit. Changes the but it's definitely not like good. I'm gonna go with all. Yeah, I've yeah, I've never yeah. liked them, and I will yeah. I will die on that hill. Yeah, me too. Uh, Paul says I live in New York City and don't have a car, but access to a garage for storage. I'm considering buying a JDM van like a Delica for upstate weekend trips with the girlfriend and dog. But my comment a few weeks back about JDM parts sourcing concerned me. Good idea, bad idea. Why or why not? Before you buy a JDM car. Make sure that there is somebody convenient to you that can work on it. If it's not you, you know, like like if you're in New York City, like figure out who works on JDM cars in or around New York City. And I mean, the parts for Delicas are better than some other Japanese cars because Delicas have sort of like a global appeal and people use them for shit. And so there's like... Coombs Country Autos in Vancouver, like they've got a lot of parts for Delicas. There's, the, and the stuff like the consumables are pretty easy to find because a lot of them are uh, are shared with like Monteros. But it's like random stuff. Like when I went, when I took the Delica to the haunted car wash in Halloween and the car wash broke the side view mirror, it took me like weeks to find a side view mirror because that's not like a, something that, that people need. So I had to like wait until somebody got one off a stripped Delica and I was able to buy it used and it was still kind of expensive. So like just do your homework and figure out like the Del- our Delica has been reliable. It hasn't mechanically, it hasn't needed much at all. It's just like there's going to, there's random shit that you can't just like get from department stores. So sometimes the guy who works on your car might not want to go through the headache of sourcing the parts. So n- figure that out before you buy the car. That's all. Siamese sports cat enthusiast. Uh, watch question. Glashuta original Panomatic Lunar or JLC Master Geographic? I would probably... The Glashuta is cool because it looks like a, it looks like a longa and it's like more, it's like longas are crazy expensive, like, you know, $80,000, $100,000. And the Glashuta has a lot of what is appealing about a longa, but a tenth of the price. So like five to $10,000. You get a lot of watch. They're, they're neat. If you, if you like these sort of complex dials where mm-hmm. there's like three different things going on, it's got the big date. I like a big date. That's pretty fun. Um, they're cool looking. Pull up the Master Geographic though. The Master Geographic is cool because it's got, uh, it's also got a lot going on. Is this it? Uh, that's the Master Control Geographic, yeah. So it's a it's a world time. So you can see, you can you turn the thing down and it's got the right. world time. I like the, the Master Control Geographic. And JLC, um, they make their own movements for this. Glashuta makes their own movements also. Um, I would probably go with the JLC. Um, that's my vibe. They're both great watches, though. Hard to argue with either. But I like the JLC Master Control Geographic. I love a world time. I travel a lot, so world time's a good complication for me. Uh, let's go down. KCR, what do you say? Can you scroll down, Zach? Thank you. Um Why do new car manufacturers such as Rivian and Lucid start by selling higher cost or more premium vehicles versus lower cost vehicles that would appeal more to the masses? Profit margins. That's why. Yep. Because you make your money back faster by selling a higher uh, higher spec car. I mean, it's just... And early adopters for a new company, a new company supporter, that's going to be a rich person. Right. Because they can afford to take a gamble on uh, a yeah. fifth car, but if it breaks, if it's yeah. weird, yeah, Someone go for it. Someone with thirty it. grand to spend on a car, they want uh, they want something dependable, where they know the network is going to be there for service and repair long term. They want a they want a track record of dependability. You know, someone who wants a Corolla is not going to want to risk a Lucid. Well, it would be interesting to see if BYD gets into North American market, mm-hmm. specifically the United States. If they'll start with a cheap car, or if they're going to start with one of their more expensive models, mm-hmm. you know, 
Because yeah. they can undercut the pricing on either one. But yeah. I wonder if they'll go after like, hey, do you want a $15,000 EV? Yeah. Here's the only one you can buy. Right. Um, but yeah, that that's why. I think I think people who are on a tight budget don't want to experiment with new companies that we, they don't know about. Yeah. Uh, Sean Finney says, EVs are depreciating rapidly, which brings some interesting low mile options in the used market. Talk about an EV6 at 40K versus a Rivian R1T at 60K versus a Taycan Cross Turismo at 70K for an urban daily driver. I realize there's a big gap in price, but all seem to offer good value. The thing about EVs is we don't know where the floor is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, as far as I can tell right now, EVs do not have a floor. Like, like an Like an iPhone that's... 12 years old is worth zero, like literally scrap. So does that happen with a car too? So I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it depends on what the cost of battery battery replacement is and when you have to do that. Like that's where the things kind of find a floor. Yeah. But it, it, I think we're a ways away from that. You know, for 40 grand, it's probably not going to be worth 40 grand in five years. It's going to be worth yeah. 20 or 15. Yeah. I mean, EVs, the value, EVs only go down except for the Tesla Roadster. And that's a different thing. Yeah, if it's collectible for some reason, then yeah, sure. But that's a that's a spe highly specific. We're mm -hmm. talking about one car. Yep. Outside of that, I mean, EV EV six at forty k. That's going down. That is, that's still going down. Rivian R one T at sixty k. Still lots of ways to go down there. Taycan Cross Turismo at seventy k. That seems kind of appealing, right? That's a that's a like also still going down though. Well, so, so my brother has bought and sold two Ford C Maxes now. Mm -hmm. He basically bought the same car, sold it, or bought a car, sold it, and bought the same one four years later. Both times it's been like thirteen grand, and those started at thirty one. So he that might be the floor of that particular plug in hybrid is like twelve thirteen grand as long as the motor works, as long mm -hmm. as the battery's okay. But we don't know what it's going to be for something like Porsche Taycan or the EV six yeah. or whatever. No um, idea. And also like. Well, I've we haven't driven the R1T, have we? I've heard the ride is. I drove an R1T. You drove an R1T. Yeah, How does that you ride mean, compare? You mean the S? Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking. We drove S. the truck. Oh yeah, the R1T rides great. How does yeah. the EV6 compare though? Because that's a lot less money. Well, the e I've not driven a regular one. I've only driven the GT. Oh yeah. So, I mean, the R1T is a lot of truck, and if low mile really means low mile, like under 10,000 miles, then 60k for that's pretty good. Same thing with the Taycan. If you're talking about under ten thousand mile Taycan for seventy grand, mm -hmm. that's all right, you know. But they're both still falling, <laughs> yes, rapidly. Especially, and I think the luxury brands will fall. They'll have, they have more room to fall. Yeah, and they will probably continue to. Yeah. Uh, who was I just in Europe with? One of the folks from Edmonds who uh, they bought a Mach E for their their fleet. They bought it. And they had to pay over to get it too, and they said they were just about to sell it and move on because they've had it for three years, and the price that they were offered to sell it confirmed that it was a good idea for me to lease mine because the the what they were offered was less than what my buyout is. Whoa. Yeah. So leasing, lease If you got an EV a couple of years ago, you should have leased it wow. because you if you got if you bought it, boy, have you gotten hosed. Um, all of them. All of them. Um, if you can afford 70K, I'd rather, if you don't need a pickup truck, don't get a Rivian because they're big, they're long, you know? And if it then is 40K for an EV6 versus 70K for a Cross Turismo, how much does the 30 matter to you? Because mm -hmm. a, a Taycan is a really, really nice thing. And everything that was wrong with them in the early cars, there is a fix for. So if it had the fixes done and the updates, it should be fine. But they're they're all going down, still going down. <laughs> uh, Jake Shores, what's the closest to wadding up a press car or accident you've had? I crashed an Audi R8 press car. So the closest was the wall on a racetrack in England. Not proud of it, but it was a lesson learned. It was raining, and I should not have been on the track actually it was raining really hard i was on our compound tires um 
Tim A says, really enjoyed the uh, Spectre review. Do you think mainstream luxury cars will eventually get the memo and reintroduce traditional button interfaces back into interiors? Well, there's a story this week that the EU is going to require buttons for certain controls. Oh, really? Instead of screens. Oh, but that's it was, cool. It was very limited. It's not like for everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I don't know. thing about buttons is... They're expensive. Yep. I mean, it's probably, I bet it's more expensive to make a row of buttons than it is to buy a screen from China. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we read uh, David Twig's book, Inside mm -hmm. the Machine, and talks about the cost difference for a key fob could be two cents, yeah. but that will, the car company will make a big decision to save two cents over a huge number of units. Yeah. So, same thing. And they can update the look of a screen more quickly yeah. with like an over the air refresh versus changing a button design. Yeah. At the the problem at the low end is, at the low end, screens add value because mm -hmm. you can have a car that does more functions without needing buttons, right? At the high end, it's kind of at the medium to high end, meaning like Mercedes, BMW, it's kind of the same thing where they're trying to cram as much tech into the car as they can while keeping costs under control. Mm -hmm. And they, you can get out of a Kia right now that has screens, and you get in at someone's BMW, and you go, oh, mine has something like this, too, yeah. in terms of functions and screen tech. Yeah, particularly if a lot of like the optional features are controlled through the screen. Mm -hmm. And you can put that optional feature in cheaper without a button. You know, But a Rolls-Royce, it's like, fuck, I don't care what it costs. Make it the best it can be, hence buttons. Um, so I don't know. I think we're all fucked when it comes to that kind of thing. I think it would take a lot of people, journalists, et cetera, reporting their pre their preference towards buttons on really expensive cars for it to trickle back down to mid because Because the middle cars always try to chase the luxury cars. Mm -hmm. Do you remember for a long time, like only really expensive German cars had window switches that were black plastic with a chrome mm -hmm. line on it, right? And the, and the switch action was different too. Yeah. But then you started seeing it on Hondas, Acuras, and, and some of the Korean brands. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, they've all done the same thing because they've all copied the luxury design from Mercedes and right. from BMW. I think you would need BMW and Mercedes to go away from screens, and then the other ones would follow. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, throw some Ds on it. A lot of words, but basically says, do you all ever see or recall any car deals that are too financially good to pass up in your opinion? $20,000 Bentley, my friend. Uh, well, with, for new cars, when they were selling the Saab 92X from GM and mm -hmm. you could do like GM red tag pricing, you could buy one for far less than a WRX MSRP. And people were buying them with that and flipping it for like four grand profit. Oh, really? And I remember also the Fiat 500e when it first came out, you could lease those for like $59 a month. Yeah. And that would have been a good idea. Yeah, when it was less than a cell phone. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want this to sound like super douchey, but I'm not looking. So like I don't watch television, so I don't I, – I I'm not trying to be a dick. But like I don't watch like cable TV, so I don't see like local car commercials. Mm -hmm. Like I don't I don't go to dealers and see what their pricing is on stuff. Like if we're going to get a new car, like I know what it is and I'm just going to order it and I'm just going to pay what the MSRP is because, you know, that's just how my brain works. So I'm not – I've never been like, holy shit, there's a deal on the Civic? Like, I better, I can't pass that up. So I'm not, it's just not how I shop. It's not, and, I, and I'm not really exposed to that information particular. I mean, when a couple weeks ago when someone was talking about the Lucid lease, the 18 months for yeah, 600 yeah. bucks, for, I went home and I was like, Hen, do you want to get a, you want to get a Lucid? And she was like, not, and then she listed off like four things that she thought were really annoying about the Lucid. And I was like, okay, well, that's the end of that conversation. So, um, but yeah, Christian, have you seen the BID Yang Wang U9 unveil? If this car is not actually called that and you just succeeded in getting me to read no, fucking that. whatever it is. Okay, cool. I was just wondering if that it's was an anchor, if that was an anchor man thing. Or it's like, he'll Wang read U9. literally anything you put in the question. Uh, the Yang Wang U9. Yang Wang U9. Where it literally jumped. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I did see that. And, you know, the, the Porsche active ride car um, can jump too. They just, like, don't do that for liability. Like, they're... If they release this fucking car to the public and it actually can do that, I'd be shocked because imagine the liability. 
Maybe not in China. Maybe they don't have liability laws like we do here. I'll tell you what, though. If I was super rich, I would find a very remote road with a little crest to it, and I would hit that button at the top of that crest. I'm bunny hopping my and car. Du- double jump? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I just want to see what happens once. I mean, I... Yeah, you. all you need is a hydraulic suspension, and you can do that. Like, the Bose one could do it. The Bose prototype with the Lexus could do it. Porsche's active ride control can do it. As long as the wheel can move fast enough. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you need, like, a high-pressure hydraulic system, and it can do it. Um, if they release that to a customer, they there's no way they would in America. Maybe in China. Maybe they don't have, like, the, uh, the laws like we have here um, where you could get sued for— that kind of thing. Um, I bet it's just a trick for marketing. I mean, it grabs it grabbed headlines. It shows off. Yeah, it's the, the same shit as the Porsche like dancing. The yeah, Porsche yeah. dancing like they won't. They can't sell that to customers either. But like, it makes it look cool. Yeah, get you talking about it. Uh, I think the electric G wagon will be able to do axis spins though. They've said that they will be able to do that. Whoa, which is cool. Uh, David Steinauer, uh, does a C6 have better steering feel and specialness? Than a C5, uh, is there a difference between the early C6s and later ones in that regard? Um, yes, it does. I don't want to be a dick, but neither C5 nor C6 will feel special at this point. They're old GMs. They're fucking plastic as can be. Yeah, they're gonna feel like cheap ass old cars. Wiggle squiggle sounds. Yeah, yeah. doesn't the lit- mean they're not great performance True. machines or reliable, or that they don't look all right, but they won't feel special. But the later C6 got the LS3, right? Yeah, Early one different, got LS1. different engine. You definitely want later a car. Yeah, yeah, different different engine. And the 05s had all those unique weird things. You had to put it in reverse to park it and yep. all that weird stuff. I mean, the rule with C5, with Corvettes is, <laughs> same as always, you buy a 1965 through 1969, or you buy the nicest, newest one you can afford. That's the rule. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, if you had oh the if you wanted to confidently LS swap a smaller cho- cho- chat okay, which would you rather put an LS in? Yes, is the question. S fourteen, a Mazda RX eight, E forty six BMW a, or a BRZ. I think I would go. Not having driven a swapped one, of, and it, well, actually, no, I drove a swap BRZ. What am I saying? Um, I would do BRZ. But my criteria was that has the newest interior. And so, like, S14s oh. probably handle it well, but if I'm just going to swap it, yeah, I'd go with the newest interior I can get. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing about LS swapping a car is whatever you put the LS into ends up feeling like a Corvette. Yes, it does. The BRZ I drove yeah. was fast and fun, but it felt, felt like and sounded like a Corvette. Then I drove the RX-7 with the LS swap, and I was like, oh, you've made a Corvette. Mm-hmm. Nice. So it's like, it's really just kind of like, well, what? Which car do you want to be a Corvette? <laughs> which car, which one of these do you like the most and you want it to be fast and loud? Yeah. That's basically it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I. You have to choose one. Uh, Gun to your head, Matt. I mean, the BMW, you know, the engine is really kind of the thing. Yeah. So I wouldn't do that. Maybe, probably a BRZ or an S14. I think you'd end up in pretty much the same place with either. Uh, Gabe. I, I have not the answer, seen I'm sorry, Gabe, the answer to your question is I have not read it, and so I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Sean wants to know what Donnie's doing on the Countach. Donnie's twiddling his fucking thumbs right now, waiting for the machine shop to return my cylinder heads and my engine block. Oh. He has cleaned out the engine bay, tidied it up, and, and readied the car to be put back together. But without a goddamn engine, not much I can do. So he called me yesterday or two days ago to apologize for the for the wait, and he said he's been bugging the machine shop guys, and they're and they are slow. Apparently, the people that work on Countach's etc. don't have to hurry because you'll wait. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they know it's not the your fuck only else car. Else, you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> um, Prashan says, do some cars just do better in different cities? Uh, you guys talked about how you don't see a lot of new Supras, but they are everywhere here. Um, I mean, yeah, cars can be regional for sure. Well, I think their design it tends to be regional. Yeah, like they, they usually are good for the areas around where they're built. At least they used to be. So, yeah, they have qualities that are helpful for the environment in which you live. Yeah, not the literal environment, but like 
No, like, like the lifestyle yeah. and the roads and the and the actual environment. I mean, yeah. you know, you're not going to see a lot of Supras, I would bet, in Colorado because it snows. Rear-wheel drive coupes are just not that popular there yeah. for a ton of different reasons. But um, I don't know where Prashan lives. Like we, I don't know. I probably see two Supras a day here. I see some Supras. Um, pff, fucking, I'm up on the mountain yesterday filming uh, with uh, with the road and track photographer, and I'm on Big Tahunga, and a guy is ripping a yellow Supra up and down the fucking mountain wearing a helmet. Ooh. Like, in the canyons. Gee. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, going, bro? I mean, going real fast. Whatever. He was going fast, but, like, I don't want to be anywhere near you. If you're, right. if you're ready to have a fucking crash that requires a helmet yeah. on a public road, like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that's aggressive. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, yes, they do. But also, like, we see a ton of WRXs here, too. And, like, nobody needs all-wheel drive here. So it's it's odd. Um, but, yes, I do think cars. For instance, no sobs. There are yeah. – I, where I grew up in, in Connecticut, it never occurred to me that I'd move to L.A. and never see a sob again. I see, like, <laughs> one a month yeah. for real. There's no sobs here. They yeah. were all over in the Northeast. So, yeah. Uh, Adida Gangadaran. Let's try that. Um, I'm dailying a 2016 Audi S4 and a 2011 Cayenne. I'm going to keep the Cayenne, but looking for something new. Considering ordering a new RS6 Performance, what else should I consider in the price range? RS6 Performance is like 125 grand. We have a baby on the way, and there's a practicality of a wagon with the space seems great. Uh, I considered an RS Q8, but I think the wagon might hold its value a bit better. Make sure you look at the values of used RS6s. They're, they don't hold their value that well. Um, they're also really stiff. I mean, they're I like also that car, not but... that interesting. Well, there's two different suspensions with the RS6. There's the fixed suspension and the air suspension. The air suspension rides better. The fixed suspension handles better. Okay, I think I drove, I rode in the fixed yeah. one then because it was like, you know, it felt like performance suspension, yeah. but not grand touring estate. Suspension. I drove both on the launch, and uh, I I actually liked the air suspension better. Um, I think in and the I think the air suspension standard, the fixed suspension's optional, and in Europe it's the other way around. Oh, um, uh, I mean, let's see, 120 grand, honest, oh, and, you, and you've already got a Cayenne. So fast, fast sedans and wagons. Well, there's a lot if you want to go electric. I mean, you go Taycan Cross Turismo. That would be fun, and that that would be nice for a kids. You could do uh, uh well, um, um, you could lucid. do like a lucid, a lucid sapphire. Uh, that might be way more expensive. It would be a lucid grand G a grand touring probably. Although if you're worried about resale, that's not the one. I mean, none of these are going to have great resale. Yeah. Like it seems like when you're shopping in that air of 120 grand, everything's going to fall pretty quickly, right? I mean, anything from Mercedes. Yeah. And there's the good news is there's tons of power available in performance. Yeah. I mean, you what you could do a Maserati Gracale, that could be pretty cool. Uh, a little low, cheaper than the RS6 performance, but definitely interesting. Yeah, you could do a e you, uh, I bet I've heard there's a bunch of cash on the hood for Aston Martin DBX 707s. Oh, a little more expensive than the RS6, but those are awesome. Yeah, looks good, sounds good. Yeah, fun to drive. Yeah, there's the the E63 Maybe. wagon still. That's always that's always a good choice. Um, and the RS6s look sick. I see, I see them every few weeks. They just they're, they're great presents. looking. Yeah, they're not that interesting to drive. Beyond being fast, they're not particularly exciting. It's probably true for most fast sedans, though, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it is. You get an M5 CS. That is fun to drive. Yeah, you yeah. Could, you could get an M5. Get CS. it with the normal seats. Yeah, that's a good car. That, uh, yeah, that could be good. How much of those? One. Yeah, uh, that 45, might be a little more. That might be like one forty-five. Maybe there's cash on the hood. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know about it. And not for a CS. Probably not. I'm just optimistic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're, they're all, they've all become fast crossovers, haven't they? Yep. There's not a lot of wagons left. If you want a wagon, you're... I would I would go Tycon Cross Turismo or Sport Turismo. That car Turismo. looks so fucking yeah. good. Sport it's Turismo really nice. where it's at. These are the last three. Yeah. Um... Connor H. says the GR86 can be had with the lower grip tires, the primacy, for those who want the car to move around a bit. Could this philosophy be applied 
to other cars. I have a 3 Series uh, that has about 30 more horsepower on paper, but a lot more weight. Would premises on my car be a bad idea? If you want the car to move around. Then it's a good idea. Then it's a good idea. Yeah. I think there's something about the character of the GR86, though, that lends itself to that movement. I mean, the steering feels really connected. They, they are light cars. It's a very direct connection. It's easy for the car to talk to me about what it's doing. If you put slippery tires on something that doesn't have that kind of steering feel and connection, to me, it's just going to feel like a shitty car. So yeah. I would be careful with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, look, they're cheap enough. It couldn't, be, it couldn't hurt to try. It's not, they're they're very cheap tires, yeah. so have a go, and and if you hate it, you learned a, a couple hundred dollar lesson. Uh, who was that next question from? That was oh, Xander Davis wants to know what I think of the Icapod C Pod. Pull up the photo of that. Um, Icapods are awesome. The company was uh, co-founded by Mark Newson, and uh, his designs remain. There's two types of Icapods, the older ones from the 90s before the company went out of business, and then there's the new reissues. Um, everything that Icapod makes sort of looks like it's from outer space, which is fun. Cool. Um, I think these C-Pods are very fun, cool watches. Um, I like the Hemipod personally for me, but if I saw someone out and about wearing a C-Pod, you would get a nod and a handshake for sure. They're funky. The rubber strap is the same as the Apple Watch strap, uh, which is which is cool. This one is uh, it's the C Pod is more of a a diver. A diver. Um, oh my god! Oof, boy, this fucking website. I I probably wouldn't get uh, one of the new ones. I I would try to find the a vintage one which from one the nineties. I have the Hemi Pod. Okay. Uh, which they don't uh, make anymore. They, that the Hemi Pod was not part of the reissue. But they're just the all of Icapod shit is weird. This is really, it's really cool kind looking. of artsy and yeah. strange. But uh, look at that one, the hourglass. It's just a secondhand hourglass that moves around. Yeah. There you go. I mean, they're really, they're really nice. They're neat. Watches. They all look like flying saucers. They do. Yeah, they're really cool. I dig it. Oops, yeah. There we go. If you, but if you can afford it, buy a vintage one from the '90s because those are appreciating in value as opposed to the reissues, which are not. Last one, Aiden Squires. What do you think of the massive charging station and truck stop they're building in Sacramento? Is this the way of the future, or would it be better to convert existing gas stations and truck stops? I don't think it's one or the other. I don't. I think Sacramento's got a lot of space. I don't know the one that they're built, the giant one they're building. I haven't seen this. Is that it? Uh, Whatever that thing is right there, plug share. Uh, I, I, I'm not really sure. But I think if you're a truck stop right now that's operating, trucks are operating, so you don't want to close. I wouldn't want to close my diesel truck stop to install EV chargers. You well, know, I don't necessarily think that they. I I don't know. I'm yeah. I I agree. I don't think they want them closed, but. It's probably both, right? You probably want to have some chargers at the existing truck stops and then also build new facilities. Probably, but I, I think, do we yet know how popular like the Tesla semis are or the electric semis? Is it, is this, no. are they building it so they hope they come? Is this a field of dream situation? I, I don't know. Is it, are the EV chargers for cars or are they for trucks? I don't know. I was assuming they were trucks what because is it, what massive did, what charging write, station the, truck stop. Only yeah, because it's a truck stop. I don't know what... I don't know what this Is station is. I've station never. Truck stop. I am I. I don't know if it's assumed that I'm supposed to. You should know everything. Know about this, but like, uh, I mean, we need more charging stations, whether it's for cars or trucks. So, build build more and keep them maintained well so they work. Mm -hmm. Like in Baker, uh, in between fucking L.A. and Vegas, they built like three huge charging stations and I've now passed by that four times and they're being used very heavily. So this might be it. Um, might the be. nation's biggest electric truck charging depot. Uh, okay. Yeah, that could be it. Um, this is what off I five wait, scroll down near uh, Sacramento international airport, uh, geared towards commercial trucks driving through I five. Okay. So sure. It doesn't look like they're tearing down people's houses to build it. Uh, also, 30 chargers for passenger vehicles at the station. Uh, uh, a few companies have, oh, Pepsi in South, Sac Pe uh, Pepsi in South Sacramento has 20 Tesla semi-trucks. 
This will be the first one open to the public. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All build, right. Well, build charging stations. It is interesting because it seems like on the consumer side, the vehicle sales have led the infrastructure construction, right. and this almost might be uh, the reverse of that. It's probably a good idea. Yeah. Well, who's going to invest five hundred grand in an electric semi truck without somewhere to charge it? Yeah. That would be. Now, because now you need it to make money. Now Here's your one ten cable. Now, yeah, now your business plan yeah. depends on it. You know, so yeah. All right. Well, that's our show today. Thank you to all of our uh, patrons for asking such good questions. Um, we will be back later in the week. Make sure you go to thesmokingtire.com. Hit that merch tab. Um, and uh, check out our new merch while supplies last. We're going to be adding new stuff there every couple of weeks, so keeping you guys in in the loop. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Happy Friday. See ya.